Good evening and welcome to DE Solutions Lab, where we identify a challenge in our practices and we bring industry experts in to hopefully help, help us give us something to think about and also maybe solve some of our challenges. So tonight's topic is a really interesting one. It is patient engagement gaps, the truth about automation in dentistry. So this is a very today topic and I think it's going to be a great one. So one of my favorite things about this event is that we, the intention of it is to get something out of it. And it's important that you do. So if you have a question, a comment, whatever, throw it in the chat. And by all means, we will get to your questions um, throughout the event today, whether it's in the beginning or during the middle of the presentation or towards the end. But that's really um, what these are about. So get your questions asked so we can hopefully answer them for you. So with me today is Jeff Barsati. He is the Vice President of Sales and Operations at Recallmax. He has spent the last 12 years in the dental industry working alongside dental consultants, tech developers, and practices of every size and structure, which has given him the unique ability to understand how technology can serve dental practices and make a significant impact. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us tonight. This is going to be a uh, uh, th thank you, Dr. Pound. It's my pleasure. Thank you for the, the opportunity tonight. Thank you. So I'm going to let you take it away. And again, everybody, when you have questions, you can send them to me or by all means, just throw them in the chat because I think other people will also have those questions. Yes, please. I'd love for this to be an interactive session. So if anything comes to mind as I go through things, feel free to leave a comment and we'll do our best to respond in real time for you. So, um, as Pam mentioned, I'm a, a vice president of sales of, and operations here at Recall Max. And uh, just a little bit about our company. Um, we were born out of a dental consultancy. And so we've spent the better part of 25 years working with solo practices, groups, DSOs, and really digging into the day to day. And I think that gives us a pretty unique perspective on not only the challenges that practices face, but also gave us a pretty good leg up in terms of designing uh, a software application that could really help boost practice performance. Um, we like to consider ourselves, um, you know, practice and network growth specialists. And I think we do things for the right reason here. And we've been able to, in our experience with working with practices for as many years as we have, um, really garner a true understanding of, of where the pain points are. Um, we're also a data-driven company. And the reason I mentioned that is we're gonna go through some stats as part of my lead in today. And I just uh, wanted to frame things in a way that, just so you know, when we work with the clients we work with, we connect to their servers and we mine all sorts of cool data. And so part of my lead in today and sort of what's on the agenda is for us to maybe set the table with current landscape. And, uh, and then we can get into the sort of topic uh, of the webinar itself, which is where automation has a place in practice performance. But I thought it might be helpful for me to paint a picture of kind of what we're seeing now and some of the challenges that we know practices are going through at this point. I even hate to use the word COVID because, you know, I think uh, we're all sick and tired of hearing that word. But I, I kind of want to frame today's discussion related to opportunity rather than sort of the doom and gloom. I know we're in a bit of a burnout phase and uh, we have staffing challenges and things like that. But I do think it's pertinent for us to talk about, you know, some of the things we can do now to not only recover, but thrive, you know, um, post COVID. We're also going to talk about sort of this idea of engagement. What does that actually mean? How do we do that when we are experiencing staff shortages? The importance of oversight is really a, 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 a nod to office management role in this and ownership roles in, in sort of achieving success. And then I thought I'd wrap up today's presentation for those that are interested with a quick look at what Recall Max, the software application has to offer and, and give people an opportunity to see what we do. So, I thought we'd start here, which is our, the, the name I said I wouldn't say, which is COVID, but 
like kind of what's occurring in the dental industry from our perspective and how it's impacting our patient base. Because I think what we're seeing is that, and, and in the feedback that we're getting from practices that we speak to, is that there's sort of this illusion of back to normal. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but we, we've gone through some pretty significant changes in the industry, as, as we all know. I mean, it started with practice closures, but since then there's been pretty significant restrictions. And then as of late, um, staffing issues. And so what I wanted to touch on to start here is that the big thing for us being sort of a recall optimization company is that four recall cycles have now been missed. In, in your conventional sense on a six month sort of uh, hygiene protocol. And so there's been a, a lot of uh, opportunity lost related to our, our, our patient base. Also, as we can all appreciate, um, schedule instability right now is huge. I mean, we've got a lot of missed appointments and a lot of cancellations happening. And I think because we have these narrow windows uh, in between waves, and we get really busy during those times, there is this sort of false sense of normalcy, which is people that are volunteering themselves back to dental practices, right? Those that are comfortable are using the opportunities in between the waves to sort of get back onto their routine. But it's interesting to see how the numbers have changed. And so in the next series of slides, I just wanted to explore what we've been seeing on our servers and then translate that to what the national opportunity is related to what we've all gone through here together. So I'll start with unscheduled patients. And what I'll reference here is this, this is sample size and the data that I'm presenting today is a, a sample size of 2,500 dental practices. Okay, and kind of what we've seen. And so pre-COVID, we saw that 52% of patients across all servers in North America didn't have an appointment scheduled in any given practice. And at the height of COVID and actually kind of where the, the um, percentages have settled now is 58%. And so we're looking at a 6% difference, which doesn't sound like a lot, but on 2,500 dental practices, again, the sample size we're talking about, it's the difference between 1.8 million patients that don't have an appointment scheduled versus 2.5. And so there's a 700,000 patient difference on our servers alone related to what's occurred in the last 18 to 24 months. And I, I would stress too that, and I didn't really preface with this um, concept, but all of the opportunity I'm gonna talk about today is related to patients that have been to our practices within the last two years. That's our true definition of an active patient. So I'm not gonna be presenting any stats here that point to patients that haven't been in practice for three, four, five, six, seven years. This is really related to our true definition of an active patient. So that's the increase we've seen in unscheduled. Um, if we look at Miss Canceled, I mean, pre-COVID, the average practice would see about 7% shifting in their schedule. 7% of patients would miss or cancel appointments same day. At the height of COVID, um, it got to the point where we had 80, 90% cancellations due to practice closures. But where the uh, percentages have sort of settled now is in and around the 18% range. So misses and cancels currently, if we're wondering why it feels so hectic at our practices, um, you couple staffing issues with schedule volatility, and this is kind of where we end up. And so to put some numbers to this, pre-COVID on our servers, 280,000 patients were missing and canceling. That number's ballooned to 800,000 or so. And so again, a difference of half a million patients on our servers alone that are now dropping out of schedules. Um, we look at due and late patients now. Okay, and these are people that could come back to our practices tomorrow. They're not just unscheduled, they're now due or late for their hygiene visits. Pre-COVID, same routine, 33% patients across practices we work with currently would not have a hygiene or recall appointment scheduled and be due or late for that. Now we're looking at 38%. So again, to make it real, that's the difference between 1.2 and 1.7 million patients. So on, on our servers, half a million patients have come off their recall routine. 
Yet when we're talking to practices about this sort of, well, we're back to normal, this isn't felt immediately because of what's happening in between the waves. And so, you know, you look at the difference there and it's pretty substantial. Okay, so again, I think if we're all sort of somewhat comfortable with how our practices are performing now, I view this as a real opportunity. Because again, these are patients that have been to our practices within the last 24 months. And so what are the, what's the value? And this is a very conservative estimate, and then I'll make this a national number, which is almost hard to believe. But if we look at um, what we're talking about here, again, referencing the last number, um, we've got just over 500,000 people off their recall cycles. If I attributed an annual spend per patient, which is, this is very, very, very conservative at $500 per year. Like, I mean, this would be a hygiene visit and a recall exam. Um, we've got $126 million worth of opportunity sitting on our service as a result of what's happened in the last four recall cycles. And again, I think the $500 is a very conservative estimate. You take that nationwide now, 190,000 practices in the US, and we now, with evidence that we've got in the in sample size we have, it would be, I think, a fair estimate to say that 50 million patients have come off their recall routine nationwide. And so that's created $12 billion worth of opportunity in our practices. If you break this down to the per practice level, it works out to on average roughly 70 to $75,000 worth of opportunity per location just in what COVID has created, not in your overarching opportunity related to your unscheduled base. And so when we were asked like, what are the highest priorities right now? And I'm sure this would ring true for most, you know, recall may not be the most, um, your, your primary focus right now. We get that because patients are volunteering themselves back. But capturing people that are missing and canceling is really important. Um, obviously, un unscheduled restorative treatment is another angle to consider because I think a lot of uh, patients postponed restorative treatments that weren't urgent based on what was going on in the industry and, and with our challenges related to COVID. And then, you know, we want to be really focused on schedule volatility. So filling openings as well as they're created. I think another key pillar from our perspective in practice success is managing our hygiene patients. Um, but it's funny right now that's almost fourth on the list. And so I don't know if there's any questions. Oh, I think we have one here. We do have a question. It's from Adam. Um, are practices getting more than normal or pre-COVID no, uh, new patients? Assuming patients are thinking about changing providers after COVID, I've experienced something similar. So I'm interested to hear that too. Well, you know, it's funny. We don't, we're kind of in the business of um, existing patient base. We, we do monitor new patient flow, but it's a really tricky thing to attribute to uh, COVID issues at this juncture. We're more focused on like the uh, existing patient base and what's occurring there. But I, I think the, the question comes, like there's certainly some assumptions we could make there related to uh, people using this opportunity to select new practices. And it's actually a perfect segue into the sort of engagement piece that I, I wanted to make today about, which is like, you know, when we're really talking about all the different opportunities we have and the challenges we have and the burnout we're experiencing, I think it's only natural to start to source options that can automate and take time away from our staff in a good way and sort of like free up some time related to uh, focusing on some of the challenges we have. And so when we get into um, like capturing the opportunity, this is something that is the sort of core of today's topic, which is, okay, how much of this can we actually automate and sort of set and forget versus really starting to think about what drives business success, not even dental practices, but any business on the planet. You know, our perspective is that businesses win when people and process combine to really create efficiencies. 
And so there's kind of like a good way to use automation and then there's a bad way. And then there's the way that we recommend, which is sort of a bridge. So it doesn't have to be versus. It can be and. But I think all too often, um, practices have more of a set it and forget it mentality, like it's their only strategy related to recovery and or scheduling. And I think it's done our, our industry a disservice to a certain extent. And so just so you know, like Recall Max, we're a company that does auto everything as well. Like we do messaging and all sorts of stuff, but it's really not our primary driver and there's a reason for that. And so at this point, I just kind of wanted to spin into, okay, well, where does messaging work really well from our experience? And again, we track this data and patient response and where does it have its challenges? And so when you look at the sort of good side, of automated messaging. I think it's been very helpful for a lot of practices. Um, and so it should be, you know, when you're looking to confirm appointments that patients have, when we're looking to reach out to patients related to newsletters and things like that, and reviews and digital forums to be screening patients as they arrive and mass email communications, like all of these things are very, very good and have high response rates. And so there, it's not that my position on the matter is that automated anything on from patient engagement perspective shouldn't be used. It's like, where does it actually really work? And a little known fact in our industry is this next slide, which is, okay, where doesn't it work all that well? And believe it or not, in this day and age, 2022, because we hear it all. Oh, yeah, well, patients, you know, we've been in the market now for uh, 11 years. And, you know, well, the patient has evolved. They're more tech savvy. You know, the psychology of the patient has changed. I, I can show you data from 2022 and compare it to data from 2013, and you'll see the exact same response rates because it's psychological. And we really want to start to think about the difference between confirming an appointment and scheduling. And so oftentimes you'll hear in the marketplace, like 70% of patients respond to automated messaging and they do, but it's important to understand the difference. 60% of those 70% of those patients are actually confirming appointments they already have. And that no doubt secures our revenue and makes sure that we help minimize cancellations and no-shows. But what it doesn't do is help us build revenues and actually grow our practices. And when you use the exact same technology, auto text, auto email, to try and get a patient to come back, whether that's a recall message, hey, you're due late, overdue, request, you know, reply with R to request an appointment, or click here to book yourself, our percentages have not changed in 12 years. So the average response rate is less than 10%. Our sample size on this and this is just last year's numbers, is 30 million messages. And this is like, you know, east to west, north to south, Canada, US, it doesn't change. And so what I'm getting at here is that 90% of the opportunity is missed when we use automated messaging and things of those natures to try and build our practices. And so it's a very important thing to distinguish um, and so what actually works, you know, when we're looking at recovery efforts outside of having a process in place that actually has people doing the right things at the front desk, it's engagement. And it doesn't matter how you engage a patient, which is kind of the cool thing. I mean, you can call them, you can text them, you can email them, but when you do that, you'll get four times the scheduling results or the recovery results, uh, picking up on a cancellation, uh, booking a treatment plan. All of those things apply to what I'm showing you on screen here. So we have another sample set of data here in which we tracked the scheduling behavior on a million communications. Okay, 675,000 of them being auto, text and email, and 425,000 of those communications being somebody reaching out to patients right? When we look at the difference here, you can see that 31% of the time when a patient was engaged in any way, 
they scheduled or recovered an appointment versus the auto service that's hovers in at around 7%. And again, it's not that you have to choose, you can do both, but that's where practices start to grow because the average practice loses about 10% of their active patient base every year, naturally, due to you know practices popping up closer by, people move, things like that. And so that's where we kind of see some of our uh, clients that we meet sort of hopping from product to product to product, looking for a magic bullet. And the hard truth is, is that there really isn't one. There isn't a magic bullet to just grow your practice. There's not a piece of software you can buy that you can plug in and not touch, and it will just miraculously create tons and tons of revenue for you from a scheduling and recovery perspective. And so our message is, well, we've got to actually engage our customers. And what a crazy concept. You know, every business on the planet kind of follows this principle. You reach out to your customers and they come back, right? And so I don't think dentistry is exempt. And, but there's, there's this idea that we can kind of work smart, not hard. And so, you know, we also get it. I mean, what I'm asking for right now is, are you killing, are you kidding me? Like we've, we're going through massive staff changes and shortages, and we're supposed to be reaching out to all these patients. Like, where are we going to find the time? Right. I think for the first time in a long time, at least from my perspective, and I don't know, Dr. Pan, if you're seeing the same thing, but for the, we're actually hiring inside of dentistry, especially for admin. And it's, it's because one in three staff members in the dental industry has either resigned or is vacant at any given time due to COVID issues. And so one of our mantras is like, you can hire for attitude and train for skill. It's kind of a, you know, an interesting concept, but we know a lot of our practices are starting to source people from the service industry or anywhere where you know that you can find somebody that has the ability to super serve your patient. And then what we want to do is implement programs, processes, things at the front desk that actually get people doing the right things. Okay. And it's not that impossible to do. And I think this is a real key lever in being able to um, sustain ourselves through this current challenge, the great resignation. So, I mean, our philosophy is this, and this is where we do the majority or spend the majority of our time coding. The, you know, it took us the better part of three years to build the app. And then, you know, we constantly improve it. But most of what we've designed is around improving the way people connect with patients, process at the front desk, because these are the people that are driving performance and coordination challenges between front desk and management, office managers, owners. When we can start to get that stuff right, it actually allows us to free up time to be with our patients and actually provide a level of service that insulates us against them going to another practice. And the little cherry on our Sunday here is the auto suite. Okay, so I, again, I, sometimes I get on my soapbox here and people think that we don't do auto messaging and things that we do, but I think that, you know, it's not the thing that actually creates success. It's a, certainly a nice to have, um, and there's some real value in it, but it, it really boils down to being able to uh, provide solutions for people that, I mean, one of our, our sayings is it's not really an, an intention problem at the front desk it's an execution problem. And we think about all of the cool things that have been innovated for dentistry. And most of the cool things end up chair side. You know, I think the front desk for the most part has been not ignored, but, you know, we have our PMs, our Dentrix and our Eagle Soft or our Open or what have you. And sure, they get an update every few years. And that's all that person should need to run a multi-million dollar business. And I think that, you know, we, we want to start to think about, well, what are some of the things we can do to actually improve those people's lives and make them more efficient so that we can start filling chairs? Another thing that we do see, and it's a stop short, is 
management has difficulty too, because there's really no way inside of your PM to truly measure what staff are doing, right? If you, our golden saying here, we have two ways of saying it, but this is my favorite way. If you can't measure what people are doing, you can't manage them. And all we have today is sort of anecdotal evidence. Yes, I can walk to the front desk and say, hey, Pam, did you do the recalls today? Or did you deal with those cancellations from yesterday? And of course, you're going to say yes, but I don't have a way of actually seeing that. Our PMs aren't designed to report activity of staff. And so there's a gap there. And if we don't have oversight, we can't impact change. Another limitation of those reporting suites is that they have us managing historically. Like the amount of practices we talk to that say things like, well, I ran my reports from my Dentrix or what have you, and I'm looking at last month's data and we didn't hit the mark here or there. Same could be said for, um, there's lots of companies in the space right now that even report uh, analytics on a, on a regular basis. But if we don't tie actions to those analytics, we don't know how to fix them, right? So one of our aims with what we do is to be able to um, have people sort of take back control and, and provide um, a solution for them that allows not just front desk to have an easier time, but to have owners and managers be able to, to drive, to be able to coach, to be able to mentor, to be able to see where, where activity needs to be spent. Okay, so I'm getting real close to opening up the, um, the app itself. But before I do that, and I'm half hour in, um, does anybody have any questions for me on the subject matter before I hop over to Recall Max? Well, one thing, I think it's more of a comment, which I think is really interesting, because I think a lot of companies that offer automated services, um, their selling point is, well, you'll need less staff. So right now with the staffing shortage, you know, you don't have to replace all of the people that you would ideally have in your practice. And it's interesting that you say, no, you still need the people. And it seems like you need kind of a, a healthy blend of automation and, you know, person to person contact. Is that correct? Yeah. Thank you for that. Like, I think that that's well said. There's a uh... You need people driving automation and then you need automation sort of like um, one of our things is like you have an external workflow and an internal one. So your external workflow is stuff like your SEO initiatives and your online booking engine and your recall messaging and all of that stuff like that's swirling around your practice. But inside where our opportunity lies and where the opportunity in our charts are, you need people driving that. And we're gonna use automation in-house, like uh, I'll show you the tool in a second, to sort of like help capture that opportunity and translate the opportunity in the PM. But I'm an, a firm believer in people build businesses. And so um, maybe that sounds archaic, but name another business in another industry that doesn't thrive with people. Like that's the point I'm getting at here, which is kind of interesting is that somehow dentistry has been convinced that you don't need people to engage customers to win, but it doesn't apply. Like that's not a universal rule anywhere else. And so there's this balance you want to use with tech where you're, you're using it to your advantage, but you're not letting it become the sole thing that you're relying on because that can be a very slippery slope. And so, you know, like our thing is, it's a combination of things. You need a fully integrated app that's bolted on top of your PM, that's gonna have people at the front desk doing the right things. Then we need to provide owners and managers with sort of like action-based analytics so that they can coach people to realize the opportunities that are sitting in front of them. And then for those that don't have the time or, don't want to manage this process, you know, we do have an academy and a platinum offering and a CS team here, Find Success. We have in-house consultants. We really get under the hood with you and help you capture opportunity without you having to do a, a ton of heavy lifting. 
And so to me, this is the cleanest path um, to success because it involves a multi-pronged approach. You're not really just putting all your eggs in one basket. I think that's great. I think um, there is a question. Um, Adam, you raised your hand, so I'm going to unmute you and have you ask it if that's okay. Sure. Uh, I have a quick question. So I think it really resonated with me when you said um, you can't really measure uh, something. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And like that makes a lot of sense. But my question then becomes when everything becomes number driven, right, then I think there's a necessary part that we're, we're kind of dehumanizing the experience, whether that might be employer employee management. Because for example, when you said we're going to measure something in terms of efficiency, how we're hitting the goals or not, the first thing that jumped to my mind is Amazon. They're very efficient. They're workers, the drivers, they do everything by the second. But then what, what we hear in the news is that the people are not happy there. They don't want to work for Amazon. They actually have the, one of the highest turnovers because people can't take it. People don't have time to go to the bathroom. So then my question is, how can we incorporate the, you know, the analytics and the measurement into it without uh, harming potentially the relationship? Because the reality is a lot of people are leaving the industry, you know, the great recession you talked about. How do you preserve that? office dynamics, but also work on improving efficiency, if that makes any sense. It does. And I think that's a great question. Uh, you know, I think that whole, uh, I'll, I'll quote Spider-Man here, I think with uh, great power comes great responsibility. And, you know, what we want to be able to provide you with is measurement, but how you choose to action that I think is where you're coming from. And, you know, there is um, some nuances there, uh, some techniques that we recommend for things like that. If you're looking to move the needle in certain areas of your practice is designating time for that. So I'm with you. Uh, the, um, the metrics that we provide aren't meant to be creating environments and practices where we're just going to like run people into the ground. I think that that would be um, counterintuitive but if we have the information, we can say, well, let's say we want to have treatment planning acceptance increase or recall uh, engagement to increase. You can employ techniques like a couple of things. Designating time is one. Very few practices actually do that. We can't expect staff to perform in between greeting and dismissing patients and managing cancellations and all sorts of stuff. So there is something to be said about uh, making sure that we carve out time for people to succeed. And that can be tricky right now. So, um, but conventionally speaking, that's what we would recommend. Um, also setting targets that are reasonable for folks. You know, when you in increase people's efficiency at the front desk with the, the app, we'll explore here in a minute together, you can have them do things at a pace that's more reasonable. So it will feel like less work, but they're getting more done. But I think, you know, there's a couple of points that, that we do that do help practices sort of navigate how to use their analytics. Another thing people do is they are actually very transparent about the analytics and they create scheduling contests and they do things that make sort of like driving performance fun versus it being like big brother has all the numbers and you better get in line because I'm watching you. And so there's some techniques you can use certainly, but it, it is about making sure that in, to your point, you don't use the analytics in a way to burn staff out and have them leave, right? I hope I answered your question there, but there is ways that you can, you can kind of have fun with the data and make it something that's a team goal. I got a thumbs up, so that's good. Thanks, Adam. Love it. Okay, so if I might, uh, unless there's any other question, um, I'll just kind of hop into Recall Max for a minute or two here. Um, are we good? I think we're good. I think we're good. Yeah, I think everybody wants to see the app. I know I do. Okay, so what I'm going to do is just do like a very high level tour. Um, shameful plug here. If you're interested in getting a complete demo, I'm just going to kind of leave this in the corner of the screen 
we're used to scanning menus, same idea here. If you wanna see something a little bit more comprehensive, um, just pop your phone up, scan that thing and, and we'll reach out to you. Um, but ultimately, uh, what I've got in the background here is a mock-up of a scheduling platform. So this could be your Eagle or your Dentrix or what have you. And then what happens is people in the morning, they, they come into work and they sign into Recall Max. We're a cloud-based application. We do free trials, no contracts. And what happens is, is that when you sign in, our app is fully integrated with the PM. So it creates a little toolbar right here. And this is sort of the PM translator, the beginning of making people be, you know, making their day easier and helping them execute. And so we read the scheduling platform every five minutes and we auto update ourselves with all sorts of information. Okay, on top of that, just so you know, we do all of the auto messaging, the email, the texting, the reviews, the online booking. So all of that's here already. But that doesn't impact the front desk. This is what impacts the front desk. And so by reading the server, one of the first things Max does is he finds and sorts the entire active patient base. So who hasn't confirmed yet? Who snuck out of our practice without booking their next appointment? Who's recently missed or canceled? Who has unscheduled treatment on the restorative front? They don't have an upcoming restorative appointment, but they have a treatment plan recommended. And then who's due in late for their hygiene and recall up to two years? Okay, this is again, auto synced. There's no work on the staff's part. Right now, if you don't know what they go through, you know, they, they print lists and they dig into their PM and they try and figure this stuff out, but it's a nightmare. And then what's worse is when you want to reach out to a patient, you know, there's a whole bunch of manual labor that goes with it. So this goes to that hire for attitude, train for skill comment I made earlier. Like, it's very difficult to figure out not only who to contact, but then like the process to contact a person and a family in a PM because you're digging through patient files. You're going to link family members. Like you're doing four or five minutes of research before you can reach out to a single person. And then if they don't respond to a text or pick up the phone, like you're defeated and then you're writing a bunch of notes. And so ultimately what we do with the application is you can click anywhere in the software. You've got all the information you need to reach out in two clicks. You've got the entire family in front of you in three clicks whether they have the same last names or what have you, I'm ready to reach out now. This five minutes is reduced to that. If they schedule, I hide us, I book them, and they drop off the software automatically. If they don't schedule, staff don't even have to write notes. They can just go like, hey, I sent a text. I, I talked to the whole family in that text, and it's done. We auto write the notes. We sync them with the PM. So it's kind of like patient engagement by numbers. You could be a person of any skill level. You know, if you're, if you're bringing somebody from the serving world into your practice, follow the app. If you're a 20 year vet, follow the app because you're going to like it a lot more than, than trying to dig into your PM to find all these opportunities. You know, we've got stuff like built in text chat, um, the ability to send forms, things like that. A follow up feature that allows our internal staff to stay on top of things because it's not just about recall or treatment or cancellations. Patients ask us for things. And that's where, if you've been to any practice, you see on the, the, the desk, there's like a thousand sticky notes and journals everywhere. And these are the things we're trying to remember, right? So we've got an internal reminder system. I need to remember to call Jill, you know, next week about that collection. I can assign it to myself or a coworker. And it's that simple. Max will remind you what to do on the day you're supposed to do it. But what's really cool about this as well is that, you know, if you happen to have a person that's vacant, like let's say they, they get sick or they're on vacation, you can cover for other staff members in here and not worry about patient needs being missed. You can also do things like search by reason. Uh, dentist walks up to the front desk, hey, we got to get our collections in for this month. Rather than me surfing through my PM or my sticky notes by person, I can just go all users, collections, and I'm done. And so we're really in the business of trying to optimize the front desk. Like the auto stuff is swirling around outside your practice walls, but in-house, how can we make sure that people are as effective as they can be, right? We look at things like a short notice feature. Um, this is our sort of cancellation or schedule opening cure. You can easily assign somebody to short notice here. You know, what does Dylan want? Hygiene. When does she like to come in? 
who does she like to see? This sort of replaces the ASAP list, if you will. It also is, a, it's more of a sniper rifle than a shotgun when it comes to, there are automated products out there that will send messages to your entire unscheduled base or something when you get an opening. But by filtering people's or patients' needs into this, when we get to the fun part, which is filling in an opening here, let's say I'm trying to fill an opening tomorrow morning at nine, I can have Max actually identify the patients that would qualify or want that appointment. And so when we find them, it's as simple as selecting them all and sending them a message. But we get a really high response rate here because we're not inundating people with stuff that they don't want. Um, again, I'm, I'm scratching the surface, but in order to respect our time here, I'm not going to go into great detail about everything that the app can do. But ultimately, I hope what you're seeing here is that, look, we talked about the opportunity related to the scheduling needs of our patient base. If I'm making any sense to you, these are patients that are not responding to the auto service because we have an auto service in place. So the people left here are the ones that the 90% that did not click the button. Okay, and so that allows us to sort of drive practice performance there. Um, now, when we talk about the other thing, which is sort of, if I can't measure it, I can't manage it. Then we hop over to our dashboards and I'll show you our current dashboard. We're actually just launching a new one here in four weeks, but I'll give you exposure to both. And you can kind of see that one of the things that we want to do and the reason we're launching a new one is, I mean, the data quality here is amazing. We've got like excellent ways for you to monitor staff, but the new one is much more modern. Um, you know, we were due for a bit of a facelift, but any, in any rate, what we aim to do for office management and owners is keep you on track on the key things that are important. Are people leaving with their next appointment? I have due and late patients. How many are being contacted? Um, who's missing and canceling, things like that. But when we really talk about the wow factor of what we do, because I know there's other analytics companies out there, it's this stuff here. So you're going to have a certain amount of opportunity in your charts. Every practice does. Okay, we talked about the averages as I was leading into this. But what we want to bring you is how are your staff actually using the app? So each and every person signs into Max every morning. And as they use different features of the software, different areas, we track activity. So who's opening what? Who's attempting what? And it gets pretty neat in the details because if I'm paying Ashley to be my recall coordinator, rather than ask her if she's been doing her recalls this month or last month, I can just generate and go like, well, she told me she's working recall, but I'm seeing goose eggs here. Okay, so that's how we can kind of claim and guarantee results because results come from activity. And if I can give you a game plan, and we can, related to your scheduling opportunities in different areas, and then we can coach your management team to say, make sure these people do these things and allocate the time and give them incentives or whatever works for your practice, Activity equals results. And that's how we do it. And so, you know, we do report results back to our clients where their scheduling opportunities are coming from, where they're seeing their gains. And this is in part why we're no contract. I mean, if I'm talking about the other guys, the scheduling opportunity is what you get is right here, this top line. And most of our clinics see 10, 15 times the results on the activity they put into other areas of the app. I mean, we can break down your treatment planning for you as well. So that speaks into this feature here, the unscheduled treatment. What is that worth? How many plans are there? How many people are working those plans? How much are you booking? And so it's just, our perspective is that. We just wanna make sure that we help you succeed and give you concrete ways in which you can use automation at the front desk genuinely to produce results. And then we provide you with the auto suite, which is, let's face it, doesn't require any of your staff's time. I mean, that's just kind of happening in the background. Um, from a training and onboarding perspective, we are uh, uh, 
We have something called the Recall Max Academy. We offer all sorts of courses related to how to optimize the software. Um, you can learn everything you want about that toolbar in three, four minute sessions with knowledge checks. Um, we do personal training for 45 minutes to get you started. So it's, it's relatively easy to onboard as well. And there it is. So I, you know, I didn't want to do like a, a 40 minute demo here, but I think it gives you enough to sort of picture how we do. And if you're interested in uh, more information, then you can scan this little guy and, uh, and we'll reach out. Well, this is really interesting. And I think a lot of us have so many questions. So please, by all means, pop it in the chat or raise your hand. Um, one question that has come up is, what if we already sort of have patient engagement software? So say we've got software to text our patients and software that will you know, generate or try to generate some sort of reviews or something like that. Will this kind of interfere with some of the existing softwares that we may have? Well, it's a good question. I mean, look, because we do that as well, we have very few clients that actually keep said system and use us as well, because you can just make the transition. Like we do all of the auto stuff as well, like the auto text, auto email, all of those things. One advantage there too, Pam, is that when you're using our app and we've auto messaged for you, you can actually see that here. And we actually have a messaging summary as well. So you can see if patients are opening things, responding to things. It actually gives your staff a little bit more insight as to who to follow up on. Because if you have a patient that has a history of responding to things and you can see that, you can kind of skip them on your recall routine. Um, but yeah, we recommend that there's a transition day that happens. So if you're using said product uh, and you're going to try us on April 15th, then on the 14th, you stop said service. And on the 15th, you start ours. And the patient doesn't know any different. It's The templates are very similar. The um, messaging protocols, you can choose time of day, frequency, you know, all that fun stuff too. Awesome. And do you integrate with most dental practice management software? We do. I didn't mention it. We Our origin story it begins in Canada. So we actually have a tougher time here in the sense that, uh, you know, we've got nine PMs that are popular here. And so we are integrated with 10 platforms right now. Uh, of note for all of our U.S. clients um, that we have, you know, Dentrix, EagleSoft, Open, um, those are, let's say, our top three in the U.S., which represent, you know, 80% of practices out there. Um, and then, of course, you know, we're, we're always integrating with platforms to, based on demand and sort of like where we see the market going. Cool. There's always questions when it comes to softwares that link with our practice management software about security. Yes. So, um, again, we're good there. I mean, our entire existence depends upon it. So we are uh, HIPAA compliant. We're fully encrypted. Um, we actually follow, we're ahead of the curve. We're one of three companies in North America that are PIA certified. Um, it's a very difficult designation to get, and it just relates to the, the treatment of patient information. Um, we have U.S. servers and U.S. cloud backup in the U.S., same for Canada, you know, Canadian servers, Canadian cloud backup uh, here. So it's, um, you know, it we do take that very seriously and rightfully so. And then anyone who would want to pursue a potential relationship, we can also send, we have a compliance officer here that can send a personal information transfer agreement, outline how we use data, all that fun stuff too, if you're worried about that. Excellent. Really, really interesting. And you also mentioned already, but I think it's worth reiterating, no contracts? No contracts. So we're a earn your business every month kind of company. Um, and I think that that's just always been our mantra. I, you know, I don't feel like we need them just because, you know, if we can pr produce results for you, then there's no need to keep you sort of committed in that sense. And so it is unique. I think we're one of very few that do that, but it, you know, it, it does also speak to our confidence. And I think that if people don't have the right fit with us, it doesn't like if I'm just have my sales hat on now, 
it, it doesn't really serve our brand to keep people where they don't want to be. And so, um, you know, we, we can, yeah, if you want to leave us at any point in time, you can do so. Uh, it's really, there's no gotchas there. Interesting. So what would it look like? So somebody's going to um, scan the QR code on the screen. You guys will reach out to them, schedule a demo. Obviously, it'll be a lot more in-depth than what we were able to do today. And then how quickly is the onboarding process and what can one expect, you know, right away after, um, you know, bringing the software into their practice? So um, we have three appointments that we set up with you. The first one is called a setup appointment. It's really just five minutes with your practice. We remote into this, your server and we just get the data coming our way. Right now, based on current volume that we're experiencing, we can usually onboard a client within eight to 10 business days. And that's kind of our current pacing. And then we also provide a, a third meeting, which we want to train your staff on this thing. But then we also have a third meeting we recommend where we train management on the dashboards, just so that they know. We call that a dashboard orientation. And that's the third meeting. We book that as close to training as possible. So all said, probably eight to 10 business days from yes to up and running. And then um, in terms of results, what the average practice sees, our average practice, now it depends on the size of your patient base, but let's say you're not a startup, you know, you're over a thousand active patients. Um, we see the average practice booking between 40 and 50 appointments per month on recall mags. And so, yeah, from an ROI perspective, two appointments pays for the software and the rest is upside. And so that's our average results. We have practices that do a lot better and we have some practices based on size that will do less than, but that's our average. Interesting. Well, I, one thing that resonated with me with your presentation, which really feels that way, is that you were saying 18%, I think if I got this right, of, of patients will make a last minute cancellation to the schedule. And I think having extra help to kind of fill those voids would be really, really useful. I think um, I would imagine if you guys are practice owners out there that you would be experiencing the same thing. It's almost like, you know, I think when I was a kid, we call it like 52 pickup where you'd like throw all the cards in the air and just sort of see what happens. I feel like that's what happens sometimes with our schedule. It's so true. And I mean, if we flash back to this, that's in part where you want to give people the tools to recover those things, not just use that short notice feature to fill an opening, but there's these patients that fall out of schedule. And historically on your PM, we delete those blocks to make room for new patients. And so they're very hard patients to find. And what is also compounding that problem is the fact that those patients recall dates are blown out in most cases. And so these, there's all these patients in like limbo land, they've canceled and haven't been rebooked, but they're difficult to find. And so that's one of the things that we can bring. Um, and to your point, like as busy as we are, we need tools to make sure that whatever time we have, we're, we're spending it in the most effective way possible. And we're not just like, well, hopefully that patient gets an email in six months to come back, right? There's, there is a middle ground here that isn't old school paper lists and like pulling our hair out. But the other extreme is let's not even worry about engaging patients in any way. Yeah. Another thing I would say I like about this software is the fact that it sort of documents every attempt to reach out to a patient. I just had this happen today where I had uh, two crowns that I tried in on somebody that I prepared two years ago. And we contacted the patient, I can't even tell you, countless times to come in. And unfortunately, every time we make a phone call, it doesn't always make its way into the, the patient you know, the area where you, you know, kind of document those phone conversations. And so, um, which I understand it, it happens, people get busy and everything else, um, but it would be nice to have something that's just sort of done for you. And you could say, hey, we reached out to you 46 times and you didn't come in. <laughs> exactly. So it's, um, I think having that documentation is also a real, um, you know, something to really help to protect your practice. 
I, I agree. And look, I, we cannot, this isn't a make wrong. Hopefully it's not perceived that way of what's going on at the front desk. Like these people have very difficult jobs. And I think that sometimes things get missed because of, yeah, busyness. And also there's so much manual labor that goes into every little thing that people can become very resigned to the work. And so like it, I look at it, there is, this is not the fault of the person at the front desk. You can only be as good as the tools that you have. And so I think that's one of our sort of core principles here is that if we expect things to change, but we don't change anything related to how people are operating, then how can we expect any sort of different results? And, you know, that's kind of, that's the whole definition of insanity, I think, right? Where we don't change anything or we do everything the same thing away, expecting different results. And I think that, you know, there is some tough love that comes with our software, but for the right reasons. It's like, hey, there's a way to drive productivity and give control back to the front desk and give control back to management. Um, we just have to be willing to put in a little bit of elbow grease. But trust me, it's way less painful than the outcome, which is 50% of our patients don't have appointments or, you know, trying to do it manually. And so that's been my sort of, um, you know, or what I wanted to talk about today is that, you know, you've got your automation running around in the background, which is great. We do that too, but there's a real opportunity to use automation in-house um, to, to better the way your practice performs. Yeah, and I, I have to say, I thank you so much for sharing this information. I think that it almost gives us reassurance that, you know, it's not just me, it's not just my practice, that these stats really do reflect what is going on in our current climate. And I think all of us could probably feel a little bit, um, you know, at least some sort of comfort that, okay, it seems like everybody's kind of going through the same thing. And it's great to have services that can help us with the challenges that we all are definitely facing. And unfortunately, we're pretty much out of time. I feel like I could talk about this topic for so much more time. So Jeff, thank you so much for your time and sharing um, your point of view with us and sharing your software and your, your ability to help our practices. My pleasure. Thank you again for the opportunity. And uh, hey, if you want to have another chat, I'm always uh, a game. So uh, maybe we could do this again sometime. Most definitely. I would absolutely love it. And so everybody, thank you so much for joining us tonight. This is Dental Economics, DE Solutions Lab. Follow us at Dental Economics Official on Instagram. And that will um, is a great place for us to share where our future DE Solutions Labs will take place. And for DE Solutions Lab, I'm Dr. Pam Maragliano Muniz, and I look forward to seeing you guys next time. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Bye, everybody.